Speaking of a reset, so if we are doing it in the spirit of what you guys both said, going into the season, we were looking at the schedule that USC was coming up against and really just kind of going, wow, this is this is going to be a hell of a gauntlet first year in. But now some of those teams that looked unbeatable, they kind of are showing, you know, kind of showing the rewards a bit. And then a team like Nebraska, who maybe I was kind of slightly overlooking, is starting to look like they're beginning to play good ball and might actually be uh, be be ready for USC, to, you know, in a few weeks down the road. So um, I was curious, in the spirit of resetting, um, any changes to your expectations for USC's uh, outcome and how you think they're going to do? Looking at how some of these teams played, I mean, like like you brought up Matt, you brought up Oregon already. Penn State kind of had a struggle. Um, after looking great in that first week, kind of have to reset a little bit there. Um, what, what are your guys' takes? And, and is there any possible uh, difference in opinions after watching USC through two weeks and then watching some of these other teams as well? Go ahead, Mark. My outlook on USC is twofold. Half of it has to do with them. Half of it has to do with Michigan. So USC, I wasn't surprised that they beat LSU. I actually predicted them to beat LSU. However, the manner in which they were able to be physical uh, at the point of attack, especially on defense, impressed me. Because as I stated after that game, and Matt and I had the discussion, of course, during the post game, was with all of this rhetoric uh, in the form of what I just mentioned with Team A performing a certain way against Team B in Week 1 and then trying to determine, okay, how valid is that or is who's good and who's bad, then you got to see him play somebody else. I'm very, um, very uh, confident that LSU is a good offensive team. They may not be Jaden Daniels offense of last year, but I'm pretty confident they're one of the 25 best offenses in college football and USC played them extremely well. And so just the, (laughs) the ability to go out there physically And in terms of technique, assignments, they were on point, close coverage. Nothing was a gift downfield uh, for LSU in that game. And then to come back this next week, and sure, USC is going to beat Utah State. But a typical USC team of the last five or six years probably scores 45, 50, 55 and gives up 24. It's a 55, 24 game, not 48 to zip. Meanwhile, in Ann Arbor, I was going into that Texas game still somewhat holding on to, well, Michigan has been all of this for three years until somebody proves otherwise. Uh, I am going to trust the culture, the team, the, 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 the toughness and all of that. How, and if Texas was going to win, I thought that they were going to finally wear out the Michigan defense in the fourth quarter because the Michigan offense was unable to keep up and giving too many three and outs. And then Texas was going to wear down the Michigan defense. However, I saw Texas moving the football pretty much at will from the first drive of the ball game. It was not a matter of them wearing them down. It was them wearing them out downfield while Quinn Ewers picked them apart. So based on what I saw out of Miller Moss, And this is what impressed me as well. And the flip side for USC against LSU, it wasn't, okay, LSU 2023 defense is horrible. Miller Moss is just throwing to guys that are just running haphazardly out in space in the middle of secondaries because of blown coverages and guys' inability to keep up. No, LSU's coverage was pretty tight the entire night. And Miller Moss was able to make what were NFL throws against good coverage most of the time. And so my opinion of USC has climbed considerably. Let's say from considering them a one of the 20 best teams in the country to more like one of the seven or eight best teams in the country. And for Michigan, going from what I thought was maybe one of the seven or eight best teams in the country to trading places with USC. Hard, hard to argue with any of that. You know, my main thing is 
it's early and teams go through so many identity and personality changes, not to imply that USC's identity is going to significantly change, but like USC is going to face a series of challenges. And it's not as though passing that first test against LSU somehow means that they're definitely going to pass this next uh, test at Michigan. But, but on, on the whole and on the main through, through two weeks, it's very clear who the top two teams in the Big Ten are. And USC is one of them. And Ohio State is the other. It's Ohio State and USC on top. Because we've seen Penn State wobble. We've seen Michigan you know, show alarming weaknesses. Iowa steps on a rake at home against uh, Iowa State. The other teams that were with USC perceived as being below Ohio State and Oregon. And of course, Oregon looks very shaky, of course. We've mentioned that already on the show tonight. Uh, but the teams that were perceived as being one tier below Ohio State and Oregon before the season, of those teams, you know, that was a quartet of USC, Penn State, Michigan, and Iowa. USC, by far the best of those four uh, through two games. But again, it's early. So, like, I'm not trying to assign any weight to this for any uh, Michigan or Penn State or Iowa fans that might be popping in here at the Voice of College Football. I'm not saying like, oh, this means this is how the season's going to unfold. This, this, like the trajectory has been established. No, but I am just saying through two weeks, like you could not have asked for a much better trajectory scenario, series of plot points uh, if you're a USC fan, because you're saying, hey, if this team can, you know, just play solid offense. And I mean, we're already doing a 180 from a year ago. If this team could just play solid, you know, high percentage mistake-free offense like doesn't usc's not going to need 40 points to beat michigan you know if usc scores 27 24 even and doesn't turn the ball over and doesn't commit any huge special teams gaffes usc wins like and, and i don't think many michigan fans would contest that like that's the scary part like, i think it's just kind of out there in the open so like the, the the margin for error for for USC, you know, there's there's some room for USC to work with. Not that the Trojans should, should tempt fate, but the, just the point is, is that like this is USC's game to lose against Michigan. You know, I don't think Michigan can win this game in the sense of I don't see Michigan making great, spectacular offensive plays and doing things to threaten USC. USC is going to have to give this game away. USC is going to have to make mistakes in order to, to walk out of Ann Arbor with a loss. If USC plays a relatively clean, relatively responsible uh, percentage-based game, field position game, uh, Trojans are highly, highly likely to, to get a win uh, up in Michigan. And the, and the good news is, traditionally, if you're looking at it from, uh, and you're looking at a USC team that's that's, Starting with a, a new defensive system, uh, starting a brand new well, brand new quarterback. You have some young players out there for SC, especially on the offense, especially on the line. You're going to want to get them early, and for them to come out strong early is a good sign because I think Matt, we, we talked this, I said it a bunch of times. Miller Moss is only going to get better. Is he's, he's just only going to get better as the season goes along. Uh, that it was really loud on the field down at um, at Allegiant, and so he passed that test pretty good. Did not get rattled. Matter of fact, played some of his played some of his best football when it got really loud. He kind of rose to the occasion when when LSU, you know, it looked like they were going to take over the game, and it got really loud. Those the the LSU fans really got into it, and and that's when Miller Moss actually played his best ball. So there's there's a lot of things pointing to success for USC. Um, they got to stay healthy, which leads to one point that we saw in the Utah State game. I said, let's just get through this game and let's get out healthy. We saw the backup um, center, Killian O'Connor, go down. Um, and the good news is, is that uh, Lincoln Riley, after practice, said that it's not a long-term injury. So it's not a, a long time, long-term sustained injury. So that's that's a good sign. What does that mean? Does that mean three weeks? I mean four weeks? I mean weeks? It doesn't. But he also brought up a really good point because he was talking about that. That you know, as far as positions are concerned, having Killian go down sucks. But you know, th there is some depth there. Um, there's 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 they know that they'll have like 
Gino Quinones, who's, who's one of the veteran linemen, who's just that guy, that that uh, Swiss Army knife that plays multiple positions, could slide inside to to um, to back up as well. So it, it's not the end of the world, but yeah, getting Killian back it would be great, and it's good to know for the young man that he's that he's also not out for the season. And it also means Jonah Monheim really, really, really can't get hurt. <laughs> Well, I mean, no, I think that's what he's saying, though, is, is you, you they feel they have capable backups in Quinones. So, I mean, that that uh, backup in Quinones. So, I mean, that they're not worried about if now our backup's gone. I mean, Grant, you're right. You don't want to go too far down on the depth chart. But realistically, there's going to be a big drop-off no matter what if we lose Jonah to, to whoever comes in next. 